The future of downtown and the need for adequate facilities for the Jacksonville Sheriff's Office and the jail may require moving both facilities off of Bay Street. But when and at what cost? Joining us is Jacksonville City Councilman Michael Boylan, who chairs a task force that seeks to answer those questions. Also, a former sheriff for Clay County wants to get his old job back. Daryl Daniels explains why he's running again. And the Jacksonville Civic Council, made up of some of the city's most prominent business and community leaders, has new leadership and a new direction. The new CEO, Dennis Whittle, joins us today. This Week in Jacksonville starts right now. Good morning. I'm Rick Mullaney, Executive Director of the Public Policy Institute at Jacksonville University, and I'm filling in for Kent Justice today. He'll be back next week. There is a growing consensus that downtown, for downtown to reach its potential and to meet the needs of the criminal justice system, the police memorial building and jail need to be moved from its current location on Bay Street. Here to discuss, here to discuss it is Councilman Michael Boylan, who is chairing a city task force to address these issues. Councilman Boylan, thank you for being with us My today. My pleasure. This is a really big topic and could dramatically affect the future of the city. So before we go to the task force, let me ask you this question. Certainly. Why is the city of Jacksonville, after all these years, considering moving the jail and the police memorial building when both it'll be expensive, it'll be difficult? Why are we doing that? Well, I think you answered your own question by saying all these years. It's 30 plus years old, doesn't meet the needs of our existing technology, uh, the work and the processes that take place inside the detention center and into the administrative offices, the police memorial building. So uh, from that perspective, I think that's uh, one of the good reasons why. The other, as you point out in your introduction, the fact that there is a greater opportunity for the development of that area as we go forward. You know, we've talked about downtown a little bit. I remember 20 years ago, we talked about the stretch from the Main Street Bridge to uh, Metro Park being the billion dollar mile. Right. Would you now call that potentially the multi-billion dollar mile and moving the jail and the police memorial building as a key part of that long-term vision? I think we all can agree with that. Our focus of the work right now isn't necessarily on location, but I think we all understand and appreciate uh, the value of that property going forward, given the adjacencies that are being built around it. Well, certainly, Councilman, this is going to be a big endeavor. So yes, where do we go from here and how do we get there? Well, uh, Council President Sam tasked me with the opportunity of leading this commission or committee, uh, this special committee, and I've broken it down into five working groups. Probably the first thing we did was take it uh, uh, with Sheriff Waters under Sheriff Corsi and, and Director Goff was to tour the facility. And the intent for me to do that was really to understand the processes of what takes place inside the pretrial det detention center and came to appreciate more than anything the condition of the existing facility and the work that, and focus that needs to be done to make it safe and secure even for today or for the short period of time. So one of the working groups we put together, one, is going to be heading up, uh, uh, taking a look at what do we do, do, need to do now in order to make that facility safe and secure for the foreseeable future until we make a decision as to move, where to move forward. And you're talking about the jail just itself now, is that the piece? We are talking about the jail, but the same is also true with respect with respect to the police memorial building. Actually, I'm heading up the working group uh, there and focusing on what can we do to create a facility that serves us for the next 30 years and beyond. So that's, yeah, that's gonna be our focus there. Focusing then on process, intake, adjudication, recidivism, focusing on housing uh, and detention, and focusing lastly on uh, what we're calling holistic services, which is behavioral mental health and physical so uh, health services that we need to provide those, not only who are uh, in need of those who are in detention, but also those providing those services. Well, let's break those down a little bit. You sure. talked about the jail and the police memorial building, and there was a time, of course, when the courthouse was right across the street. Right. And for decades, those, that location made sense but since we now have a new courthouse in a new location and you have to put inmates on a bus to get them there anyway, is it really tethered to that location for anything other than history? It isn't. It isn't. As a matter of fact, as you probably know, the pretrial detention, uh, pretrial pre uh, uh, hearings are ha actually not happening in the existing facility right now. They're all being done by Zoom. Obviously, that's a result of COVID. They've continued that practice over. So the judges, for the most part, do not come to the jail for the pretrial. Uh, and I expect we will see an opportunity. I did have a chance to tour that whole process going uh, th uh, through the various intake and outtakes and the processes at the courthouse itself, which is pretty extensive. Over 300, on a given day, over 300 inmates are transported back and forth between the jail and, and the current courthouse facility. 
There may be a rationale for having an adjacent facility close to the courthouse, but not necessarily immediately attached to it. We, you're touching upon something that right. that's discussed a lot, and that is that we have a separate facility off of Lanny Road for longer term right. and a near term. So how do you see that potentially working in the future? Well, as we take a look at, when, when, let me just take a quick step back, if I can, in the context of the processes of the working groups. What we are doing right now is basically a needs assessment. And many of us, uh, working group chairs, are meeting with companies, construction companies, and other developers who create these kind of facilities for them to understand what we think we need going forward. And then for the, a couple of meetings of each will be about some of the best practices, what's happening in other communities, what have they done to address or readdress, if you will, how they handle these kind of procedures. So that's taking place right now. And then we'll come together in January the, work, the five working groups make a determination as to where do we go from here in, in terms of that process. And that was going to be my next question, mm -hmm. the timeline for this. Sure. Pretty ambitious timeline, actually. Within about 90 days, each of your working groups, I take it, will both report out and have a series of recommendations. Correct. Is that right? Correct. And then we'll start the journey of deciding when and where to build and what to build going forward. Money is the big topic. Of course. And many have talked about this comes with a big price tag, of course. But there also sounds like there's a big price tag even for the status quo when you take a look at the jail and the police memorial. It's building. pretty remarkable if you take a look at that, uh, what we are uh, expending these days for these kind of things. We talk about a variety of issues, uh, you know, the incarcerating those who mental health or behavioral health issues cost us a whole lot more than dealing with them in a facility and environment that would best meet their needs going forward. We recycle an awful lot of folks as a result of that. And that big price, too, for the police memorial building in conversations with you, not only their issues in terms of repair, but simply Jacksonville has grown through the years. What about that facility now in serving the needs of the sheriff's office? It doesn't. Pure and simple, it doesn't meet the needs of that. Let me give you a quick example. Roughly 215 parking spaces in that uh, below the, uh, and, and adjacent to the facility. There are, at any given time, 400 to 500 people, um, civilians and JSO officers operating inside that building. And we're losing, as you well know, with the development across, the, across Bay Street, we're going to be losing that to development soon because lots of cars now are parked there. So we're looking at how do we address that issue in the short term as an example. Hard final question for 15 seconds. What potential cost and when? I, I, dare, I dare answer that question because I don't know the answer to the question. But it, you, it can be excessive. There's no question about it. I'm probably 20 to $40 million. Take your pick. Thank you for being with us. I've heard $400 million. Well, I was being generous. <laughs> thank you for being with us, and thank you for your service. Absolutely. After the break, former Clay County Sheriff Daryl Daniels is vying to become sheriff once again. He joins us with why he's running again and the message he wants voters to hear. That's next on This Week in Jackson. You're watching This Week in Jacksonville. Welcome back. Daryl Daniels is the former Clay County Sheriff. He lost his re-election bid three years ago when he was arrested following a sex scandal. He was suspended by the governor. Then he faced the charges in a high-profile trial where he was acquitted. Daniels spoke with Kent Justice recently about the decision to get back into the public spotlight and to run for sheriff again. It's been a year since um, the jury said not guilty. Yes. And it's been a month since you said, I'm back, I'm going to run for office again. Right, right. Uh, what happened in that year to bring you to this point? It's, it's more than what happened in the year. It's, it's the culmination of from 2019 up to this point, up to last month. You know, life happened. And, you know, the dynamics of life and the different challenges that we face, that's what make us who we are as individuals. You know, character is built by the way we deal with situations like, like what happened to me. Um, you know, I've had the time to reflect on, on, you know, my faults, my weaknesses, and how do you strengthen those things, and, and who do I lean on to, to make myself better, you know, not only as a man, but a, as a leader. And, you know, I leaned on my faith, I leaned on my family, and, and my friends, I know that sounds, that sounds pretty cool, but that's the, the long and short of it. So, you know, in time of reflection, it wasn't always my desire to, to say, you know what, I'm going to get on the comeback trail. But when I look at the quality, in my humble opinion, 
the quality of, of how the delivery of law enforcement services is going in Clay County, I think I can do a better job. In fact, I know I can. And the things that I feel aren't being done right now was really the main reason why I want to get back in there again. Well, let me, let me go back to something you mentioned a moment ago. You said life happened yes. uh, in these three plus years, four years, really. Yes. And you, it sounds like you took an inventory. You said you reflected on Absolutely. some of your weaknesses. What are those things that you would tell viewers and, and people in our region and in Clay County, uh, what has changed? I've changed, and to, I think for the better. And you know, we, I'll be going on 60. I'm, I'm close, closer to 60 than not. And 60 year old men, they behave a certain way. Married men behave a certain way. Leaders behave a certain way. And I've had time to reflect on every one of those categories in my personal life. And, you know, my desire is to be a, a better husband, a good husband, a better leader, a good leader, and a person who leans hard on his faith. And that's what I've done. You know, I, I love my family. I love my wife. I love the citizens of Clay County. I love the way that they interacted. See, that's, those are the fond memories that I have of being in the sheriff's seat. The things that happened a few years ago and led to uh, the charges and then a trial and then your acquittal, all of that, very public uh, for what most people would absolutely want to keep private. Uh, I tell you, who would I tell you, feel Tim. embarrassed by all of that coming out. So I think a lot of viewers are gonna wanna know, why do you wanna step back into the spotlight? Let's, let's talk about that for a minute. It's particularly embarrassment. Yes, I was embarrassed. But where does embarrassment come from? Pride. Pride is what the root cause of embarrassment. That's where it comes from, pride. And let's face it, you know, the way that I carried myself sometimes was in a prideful manner. I'm, I'd be the first to admit that. Sometimes, let's, I'll, I'll take it back a step. When I was a kid, there was the type, these types of children that I grew up with the ones whose parents gave a firm look when they did something wrong, and that worked. That didn't work for me. Those parents who had kids who they got put in time out, that, that was an option in my home, but that didn't really work for me. And then there was the type of child who required a little, something a little firmer um, than that. We call it corporal punishment. Now that got my attention. Uh, when I was a kid. I didn't get that all the time, but those are, those are attention grabbers. Now let's look at the bigger picture when you talk about the way God views situations and he knows every individual and what they stand for and the things that they will do or are prone to do. He probably looked inside me and my life and said, I know what it's gonna take to get him where I want him. I'm gonna have to take him down a notch to get some of that pride peeled off of him, to work him through the refinery so that I get to the person that I really, really want to deal with. And that's, I think, that's the reason why things kind of play out the way they did for me. Um, that's how I'm viewing the situation, and uh, I think I'm better for it. I wouldn't, now, I, can't, I can only speak for myself. I wouldn't trade the experience, the heartbreak, the pain, the tears, the embarrassment, and all that went into that. I wouldn't trade that because it's what makes me who I am before you right now, a person who has learned from those things. Daryl Daniels told Kent he is a better person after going through the past few years and credits his wife's encouragement and accountability for getting him through what happened. We're going to take a quick break. When we return, new leadership and a new direction at the Jacksonville Civic Council and some big issues facing the city. That's next on This Week in Jacksonville. You're watching This Week in Jacksonville on Channel 4. Thanks for staying with us. The Jacksonville Civic Council, made up of some of Jacksonville's leading business and community leaders, was established in 2010 and over the last decade has been involved in a number of significant issues facing the city. Today it has new leadership and a big vision for its future. 
Here to discuss is the new CEO of the Jacksonville Civic Council, uh, Dennis Whittle. Dan Dennis, thank you so much for being with us. Thanks for having me, Rick. Lots to talk about today. An organization that maybe is not as well known in the community as it should be. We'll talk about that. But you've been on the job now for about a month or so. That's right. How about telling us about your background and your path to becoming CEO of the Jacksonville Civic Council? Well, Rick, I have, well, was born in rural Kentucky and went to school in North Carolina. And since then, I have worked all over the world. My first career was at the World Bank, where I worked in Africa and Asia and even the former Soviet Union. Uh, and then I went on to found, co-found a global crowdfunding website and have founded several other organizations. So I've done business, I've done government, I've done nonprofits. And in a strange way, that sort of prepared me for my current job as the CEO of the Civic Council. Which really was going to, is the that second part of that question is that extraordinary background. What, how was that path to, be, to becoming the CEO of the Jacksonville Civic Council? Well, I moved here about four and a half years ago and continued my work uh, nationally and internationally. But I was intrigued from the minute I arrived in the city by the number of world-class people, world-class businesses, world-class initiatives that I saw here. And so when I was approached uh, uh, to possibly run the Civic Council, I thought this is the opportunity of a lifetime to help make Jacksonville a world-class city. Well, let's talk about the Civic Council. You know, it was established over a decade ago. It doesn't necessarily have a real high profile in the community, but it's taken on some really big issues. In fact, it was very, very big and instrumental in the JEA, proposed sale of JEA, and some other issues. But for our viewers, how about telling, just explaining who is the Jacksonville City Council, its membership, and what's its purpose? So the Civic Council was founded about 12 years ago by five individual businessmen who were concerned about certain aspects of the direction of the city. And they were people who were willing to put the city ahead of their own personal interests. And so they created this sort of informal no-name group. And it's grown over the past decade to encompass 75 CEOs, uh, mostly in the business sector, but it also encompasses academia and some of the larger nonprofits. And all of them come together to look at the longer term vision for the city beyond the political cycle mm -hmm. and to think about how they can make not only the business environment better, but better education, better social services, uh, all the things that make a city a great place to live and work. Well, let's talk about the future then, not only the future of the city, but the future of the Civic Council. What are your thoughts on its future and how do we go about getting there? So one reason I agreed to take this job is because the Civic Council had just gone through a strategic planning process. And as part of that process, they decided to go from being reactive when big issues, some of which you mentioned, came up uh, and focusing on one or two issues at a time. And they said to themselves, what would it take for us to be more proactive and to look at the bigger picture? and get out there. So as part of the strategic planning process, they came up with a very exciting vision, which is within 10 years to make Jacksonville a destination of choice for businesses, families and individuals, and graduates. Well, let's talk about that vision. We have it here in the graphic behind us and to help illustrate and maybe talk about some of the four pillars or the four strategic priorities of this plan and where you hope to take the Civic Council. Well, the, the graphic that you see here represents uh, input from people all around the community. And it's one of the things I found so compelling is that uh, the Civic Council, which had been small before, uh, went out and asked uh, people, especially young professionals who are trying to attract and retain, uh, what, is, what constitutes uh, making the city a destination of choice? What matters to you, not just, matters, not just what matters to us? And so this represents uh, the culmination of all those discussions, but it boils down to four categories, or what we call strategic pillars. Okay. Number one, inspire. How do we inspire ourselves, psych ourselves up, that Jacksonville is already great in many ways, and it can become a world-class city, a destination of choice. So you know, how do we tell our stories? You know, you know Dennis, uh, we've lived here since the 1960s, and a big dose of self-esteem goes a long way. And I think this number one pillar begins to hit on something that has been a historic challenge for Jacksonville to feel good about itself and its future. So is that sort of the first, is that a part of this first piece? That, that is the central to the piece. And I think me as a newcomer, I have a little outside perspective on that. And I can tell everyone in Jacksonville my new hometown, that there are great things happening here. They're great people. They're incredible businesses and organizations. And we need to own that and be proud of it. 
and we need to figure out a way to combine, bring in even more, combine it all into something that adds up to a great city. And I'm confident we can do it. And the second pillar? The second pillar is prepare. So we all know the world is changing, the workplace is changing, and if we don't prepare our young people for the workplace of tomorrow, not the workplace of yesterday, we will not be able to have the vibrant businesses and, and communities that we need. So prepare relates to everything from early childhood education, third grade literacy levels being one of the most important indicators, all the way up through post high school. And that can be university in some cases, but not in all cases. Many people need more vocational training or on the job training. So it's soup to nuts with respect to preparing our young people of today for the workforce of tomorrow. And how about for that third pillar? So the third pillar is connect. And that is how do we bring the city together? How do we make the neighborhoods more vibrant? How do we do things like, uh, how do we grapple with issues like the stadium? Uh, and uh, 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 all the infrastructure needs that the city has, uh, academic, uh, uh, everything from academic to sewage and sanitation, soup to nuts on the connect side. And our final pillar. And the fourth pillar is what we call advance. And this is really economic mobility. It's what I call opportunity for all. And we know that there are big disparities within the city. There's economic disparities, racial, social disparities. We have to tackle these head on because we know that all healthy communities have excellent economic mobility and we're gonna do better on that. Dennis, that time flew by. There's a lot more for us to discuss, but we're out of time for today. Thank you so much for being with us today and for your service. Thank you very much, Rick. And thank all of you for joining us. Kent Justice returns next week. And be sure to tune in then for This Week in Jacksonville. I'm Rick Mullaney, Executive Director of the Public Policy Institute at Jacksonville University. Have a great Sunday and a great week. See why every day more people are choosing News 4 Jax, Northeast Florida, and South Georgia's number one source for local news.